Hello everyone, this is Sarah's Trivia, and today we're concluding our Liu Bao, the Governor of Jin Let's Talk Lore series with episode 6 titled Inheritance Crisis. Before we get started, here's the answer to our trivia question from our previous episode. Now we ended last time as we covered Liu Bao's inaction during the Guandu campaign, but as the Battle of Guandu came to an end with Cao Cao as the victor and Yuan Shao fleeing back to the north, Liu Bao finally took action as he would send a force of 10,000 troops to attack the Siula County in the southern part of Nanyang Commandery. At the time, Cao Cao didn't leave much of a defense behind in Nanyang, as the majority of his forces were either north near Guandu or south in Runan to deal with Liu Bei. As a result, Siula didn't have any garrisons, but the local mayor, Du Xi, was able to muster 50 volunteer conscripts from the strong and able body as they would put up a fierce defense of the city on top of the city wall armed with bows and rocks. Eventually, Liu Bao's forces would overwhelm the defenders and take the wall as Du Xi's side would lose 32 defenders while inflicting hundreds of casualties on Liu Bao's forces. The remaining 18 men, including Du Xi, would flee the city as Liu Bao's forces would give chase. In the end, only Du Xi would survive as the rest would give their lives to protect him during this retreat. Now, Du Xi is mentioned here because he would go on to become a advisor to Cao Cao before heading west to serve as the chief military advisor to both Cao Zhen and Sima Yi during all five of Zhuge Liang's northern expeditions. Now, Liu Bao's attack on Cao Cao would end with the capture of Xi Le, as perhaps Liu Bao lost the appetite to fight after seeing the fierce defense put on by Du Xi and just a handful of conscripts. But things would turn around for Liu Bao late in 201, as Liu Bei would arrive after being pushed out of his position in Runan by Cao Cao's forces after the conclusion of the Battle of Guandu. And after a brief meeting with Liu Bei's envoy, led by Mi Zhu and Sun Qian, Liu Bao would personally leave Xiangyang to welcome Liu Bei into the Jin province, as Liu Bao knew he needed more capable fighters to resist Cao Cao. And very much like Liu Bao's arrangement with Zhang Xiu, Liu Bao would agree to shelter Liu Bei on the condition that Liu Bei would act as a border vanguard against Cao Cao's forces as the city of Xinye was given over to Liu Bei. Now unlike with Zhang Xiu, Liu Bao would not hesitate to use Liu Bei as in early 202, Liu Bao ordered Liu Bei to lead attack against Cao Cao's holdings in Nanyang and thus, Liu Bei and Cao Cao's forces, led by General Xia Hudun and Yu Jin, would meet and clash at a hill named Bo Wang Po. Here, Liu Bei would set up a ploy where, after spotting Xia Hudun and Yu Jin's forces, Liu Bei quickly ordered his troops to light some of their own supplies on fire as they hastily retreated behind the Bo Wang Hills. Looking at Liu Bei's action from a distance, Xia Hudun and Yu Jin came to the conclusion that Liu Bei must have not expected to bump into this much resistance in Nanyang. So in a rush to pull back, Liu Bei chose to burn down his own supplies rather than have them fall into Cao Cao's hands. Now, as Liu Bei had been a thorn in Cao Cao's side for exactly a decade now, ever since Liu Bei first arrived in the Xu province in 192 to aid Tao Qian, Xia Hudun and Yu Jin didn't want Liu Bei to get away that easily, as they quickly ordered their forces to give chase. However, just as Xia Hudun and Yu Jin's forces rounded the hills at Bo Wang, they quickly realized that they had fallen into Liu Bei's trap, as not only was Liu Bei's vanguard unit not running away, there were more troops hiding behind the hills as an ambush was sprung upon them. Xia Hudun and Yu Jin's forces would both take heavy losses as they fought their way out of the ambush and retreated north, while Liu Bei's forces continued to give chase. Only when Li Dian's reinforcement appeared on the horizon, did Liu Bei halt the pursuit, as Liu Bei realized that once Li Dian's troops joined the fray, his own troops would easily become outnumbered, as Liu Bei just didn't have that many troops under his command at this point. Regardless, the Battle of Bo Wang Po was a resounding victory for Liu Bei, as it would become the inspiration for Zhuge Liang's first fire attack victory against Cao Cao's forces in the novel Romance of the Three Kingdoms, even though historically this battle occurred five years prior to Liu Bei's recruitment of Zhuge Liang. Now, after Liu Bei's victory at Bo Wang Po, 
Cao Cao didn't seek retribution as the death of Yuan Shao in 202 opened the door for Cao Cao's northern expansion. As for the next five years, Cao Cao would be occupied fighting with Yuan Shao's three sons in the north. While this would be another golden opportunity for Liu Bei, Liu Bei once again missed his chance as instead of giving Liu Bei more resources and troops to continue to attack against Cao Cao, while Cao Cao was occupied in the north, Liu Bei decided to bench Liu Bei. As Liu Bei's growing success and increasing popularity amongst the Jin Province gentry clans were now being seen by Liu Bei as a potential threat to his own position inside the Jin Province, while Liu Bei would not do anything overtly to sabotage Liu Bei or cause him any harm, Liu Bei did put Liu Bei on ice to the point where Liu Bei once lamented how he was starting to feel old and useless when he felt fat. Growing on the inside of his thighs due to a long period of inaction, where previously Liu Bei was constantly out riding horses and fighting in battles. By 207, after Liu Bei turned down yet another request from Liu Bei to attack Cao Cao, when Cao Cao launched his bold attack on Yuan Xi and Yuan Shang, who had escaped to join the Wu Huan tribes in Liu Cheng, all the way up in the far north, even Liu Bei started to regret not listening to Liu Bei. As after this campaign, Cao Cao finished uniting the entire north, as Yuan Xi and Yuan Shang would end up being executed by Gong Sun Kang in Liao Dong. Liu Bei went as far as apologizing to Liu Bei in person, as he lamented that because of him, they had missed a great opportunity. Liu Bei humbly replied that in this time of chaos, a new opportunity is always just around the corner, and that there's no need to lament on the loss of this one. As long as they seize the next one. Now, unfortunately for Liu Bei, there would be no more opportunities as his health started to decline in late 207. This was not particularly surprising, given that Liu Bei was already 66 years old, and that 207 also happened to be a especially cold year, where several plagues ravaged all of China, especially in the north, as Cao Cao's advisor Guo Jia and the Surrender General Zhang Xiu would both die this year. On their way back from Cao Cao's Liu Cheng campaign, luckily Liu Bei did survive the winter of 207. But with no signs of improvement in 208, Liu Bei knew he was not long for this world. Now Liu Bei had two sons, both with his first wife, who had already died before Liu Bei became the governor of the Jin Province. Liu Qi, the eldest son, was Liu Bei's favorite because Liu Qi looked almost exactly like Liu Bei, tall and handsome. But after coming to the Jin Province, Liu Bei's second son Liu Cong took a political marriage with Lady Tai's niece to further cement Liu Bei's relationship with the Tai clan, who he had to rely heavily to consolidate power inside the Jin Province. With this relationship in place, Liu Cong quickly became the favorite of Lady Tai and many of the gentry clans inside the Jin Province, as they felt he would better represent their interests after Liu Bei's death. So for a long period of time. Lady Tai and the other gentry clan officials started to pick on Liu Qi, and use their influence over Liu Bei to drive a wedge between the two of them, until Liu Qi finally lost favor. The situation became so bad for Liu Qi that he started to worry about his own life, as he feared the Tai clan might make a move on him in secret to clear a path for his younger brother Liu Cong. So Liu Qi went to Liu Bei's advisor Zhuge Liang to seek counsel. At first, Zhuge Liang didn't want to get involved as he was married to Lady Huang, whose clan had close ties to the Tai clan. But after Liu Qi trapped Zhuge Liang on the second floor of his personal library by literally pulling the ladder away, Zhuge Liang had to give Liu Qi advice as he suggested to him that he should volunteer himself to become the next administrator of Jiangxia after Huang Zhu's recent death, as a means to not only leave the potential dangers behind in Xiangyang. But also strengthen his own position with troops and his own commandery. Liu Qi took this advice and was granted the position by his father. But while this plan was sound, it did take Liu Qi out of the picture in early 208, when Liu Bei was on his deathbed. At the time, Liu Qi did return to Xiangyang to try to see his father one last time. But the Tai clan was so worried that Liu Bei might name Liu Qi his heir on his deathbed that they simply kept the city gates shut. As Liu Qi was denied entry into the city and forced to return to Jiangxia, further complicating Liu Bao's death was the fact that in early 208, Cao Cao, who had just finished uniting the north, quickly turned his eyes on the Jin province in the south, 
as he was now finally able to throw the majority of his armies at the Jin province. With Cao Cao's forces pressing south, Liu Bei was summoned back to help defend Xiangyang, as he was ordered to garrison in the Fan Castle on the north bank of the city. Liu Bei was able to see Liu Bao one final time, as Liu Bao offered to give the governor position to Liu Bei, as he felt only Liu Bei could possibly hold back Cao Cao's advances. But out of respect to Liu Bao's hospitality for sheltering him in these last few years, Liu Bei declined, stating that it should go to one of Liu Bao's sons. And thus, when Liu Bao finally drew his last breath, with the Tai and Kuai clans in control of Xiangyang, Liu Tong was quickly named heir and the next governor of the Jin province. Now, a key point here is that the Tai and Kuai clans did not make the news of Liu Bao's death public, as they needed some time to convince Liu Tong to surrender. For unlike his portrayal in Romance, Liu Tong didn't actually want to surrender, as in his grief for his father's death, he did not want to be the one to hand over everything his father had built to Cao Cao without putting up a fight. However, officials such as Kuai Yue, Tai Mao, Han Song, who was soon released after Liu Bao's death, all supported surrendering to Cao Cao. Now, the key official who would finally convince Liu Tong to surrender to Cao Cao would be Fu Xun, who made three strong points to support his case. First, Fu Xun argued that they were all subjects of the Han dynasty, and that Cao Cao now represented the court, the emperor, and thus the dynasty. And if they resisted and strike back at Cao Cao, they would all become traitors. Second, Cao Cao had just united the north and now owns more than half of the provinces. If they tried to resist him with just the strength of one province, it would not end well for them. Lastly, and most importantly, if you think that you can rely on Liu Bei to defend the Jin province from Cao Cao, then should Liu Bei succeed, he would become the one to rule the Jin province in the future, and not you. Seeing no flaws in Fu Xun's logic, Liu Tong agreed as he first sent messengers to Cao Cao before informing Liu Bei of the surrender. As Liu Bei was still preparing the defenses at Fan while all this was happening. And when Liu Bei was finally given the news, he pulled his troops from Fan to flee south to rendezvous with Liu Qi at Jiangxia. Zhuge Liang did try to convince Liu Bei to attack Xiangyang and just take the city and thus the province for himself, but Liu Bei did not want to harm Liu Bao's son as he simply visited Liu Bao's fresh grave outside the city and yelled inside the city for Liu Tong to come talk to him, hoping to convince him to change his mind about the surrender. While Liu Tong would be too ashamed to face Liu Bei as he chose to remain inside the city, there were many other civilians, officials, and troops who decided that they would rather follow Liu Bei than stay behind with Liu Tong to live under Cao Cao's rule, as they left the city to flee alongside Liu Bei. And by the time Liu Bei reached Dangyang, he already had more than 100,000 refugees that had joined him. Speaking volumes to Liu Bao's initial fear about Liu Bei's rising popularity inside the Jin province. Now, as this series is about Liu Bao's life and the fact that we already covered this part of Liu Bei's story in our Trippy Let's Talk Lore series, we're just going to end this episode and the series with the fate of Liu Tong, who was killed in the Romance of Three Kingdom by Cao Cao, when historically, he was allowed to live as he was made a minor official and moved north away from the Jin province. Other Gentry clan members such as the Tai and Kuai clans as well as Han Song and Fu Xun were all handsomely rewarded with court positions for their respective roles in convincing Liu Tong to surrender. Which goes to show you that Liu Bao's reliance on these local Gentry clans was always going to be a double-edged sword. And with that, our episode and the series comes to an end. Hopefully y'all enjoy this episode and series enough to consider subscribing to the channel for more content like this on Three Kingdoms history, or support the channel by leaving a comment below, or simply hit the like button, as our next series on the Prime Ministers of Shu Han will drop once this video hits 300 likes. And as always, I'll see you all then. Bye!